Hi everybody, welcome and bienvenidos. My name is Pamela del Valle and I'm a part of the CSFR Committee to Stop the FBI Repression. Um, so a little bit about CSFR. We organize to support communities and movements against political repression here and abroad. This includes organizing towards an end to state violence and harassment as well as an end to US wars. Um, today we're joining the New York Puerto Rico resistance to speak about the FBI suppression of the Puerto Rican independence movement. We'll be delving into the FBI's oppressive tactics, people's resistance to them, and how we can fight back in the present day. Thanks. Thank you. Um, my name is John. I'm with uh, New York Bolivar Resistance. Uh, New York Bolivar Resistance is a grassroots community organization that's a part of a larger national group of uh, organizations in Chicago and the Pacific North Northwest. And we are committed to decolonizing Puerto Rico. Our uh, principles are decolonization, solidarity with people's movements in Puerto Rico, uh, liberation as a human right, and the diaspora struggle connecting the struggle uh, with displacement and gentrification here uh, with people going through the same things over there. Um, so speaking for CSFR will be Jessica Schwartz, who has been a member for the last year and a half. Jessica has been involved in political organizing since she was in college, including for a CSFR chapter in Tampa, Florida, as well as in the student and anti-war movements on campus. Among her talking points will be the history of the FBI and past and present examples of its counterinsurgency programs. And speaking for uh, New York Bolivar Resistance, we have Jorge. He's going to be speaking about uh, the history of FBI repression regarding uh, the nationalist movement and the Young Lawrence Party. And then we also have Rafa, who's going to be speaking about um, the repression of uh, uh, the violence directed towards Filiberto. We have from uh, uh, Se Acabaron Las Promesas in Puerto Rico, we have uh, Jocelyn Rodriguez. All right, hello everyone. Again, as Pamela mentioned, my name is Jessica Schwartz, and I'm an organizer here with the Committee to, the committee to Stop FBI Repression. I'd first like to thank New York Barrique Resistance for inviting us to co-host this event today. And last week, we marched together in the New York Puerto Rican Day Parade in solidarity with the people of Puerto Rico and the demand for independence from the United States. To this day, Puerto Rico is still a US territory, and as a result, those who fight back against this status face intense political repression. And one way that this occurs is through the FBI. But before the later speakers go into what the FBI has done in Puerto Rico, I'm here to give an overview of the FBI, its function of political repression, and how the Committee to Stop FBI Repression is fighting back on a local level. All right, so just to get into the background and foundation, so the Pinkerton National Defense Agency, also known as the Pinkertons, um, was established by Alan Pinkerton in 1850, and then during the 19th and 20th centuries, they would intimidate striking workers through goon squads, kind of like what we see now within the NYPD. And they would keep strikers and suspected unionists out of factories, would infiltrate unions and supply guards. And then in 1902, Alan Pinkerton donated photographs to what was then called the National Bureau of Criminal Identification, which was founded in 1896 by the National Chiefs of Police Union and was officially opened in 1897. The FBI was formally founded in 1908 in supposed response to the growth of US cities and technology, making organized crime more easily committable on a larger scale. However, based on this background, the FBI certainly had a political motive of targeting oppressed peoples and in movements. So which way should I? And so first, I'm going to talk about some early cases of political repression by the FBI. So one of the early targets that we've seen were anarchists um, who were targeted as a result of the assassination of President McKinley in 1901. Attorney General Alexander Mitchell Palmer and then J. Edgar Hoover, who was the head of the Department of the, he was the head of the Department of Justice's General Intelligence Division. And they used the Anarchist Exclusion Act to deport Emma Goldwyn Goldman, sorry, who was a prominent anarchist organizer. And this act was used to deport any non-citizens that they viewed as advocates of revolution. And then also after the Russian Revolution, the fear shifted towards um, what they called Bolshevism. 
which was leading to the Red Scare and included the execution of Ethel and Julius Rosenberg, as we see right here, um, because they were suspected as spies for the Soviet Union. But of course, as we can see, this is all like a certain political motive to instill fear into people against fighting back against the system. And as many of us here know about COINTELPRO, but I'm going to talk about it again. So the FBI's counterintelligence program, or what is known as COINTELPRO, it was founded in 1956. And this included a series of illegal covert operations to infiltrate, disrupt, and neutralize various leftist and national liber liberation organizations and leaders. And this has included the Black Panther Party, Students for a Democratic Society, the Communist Party, the American Indian Movement, anti-war protesters against the Vietnam War, and of course, the Young Lords. And this program was under the leadership of, as I mentioned earlier, J. Edgar Hoover, in which included the arrest of American Indian Movement leader Leonard Peltier, the targeting of Martin Luther King Jr., which included a um, the FBI sending him letters trying to convince him to commit suicide, and the murder of Fred Hampton. And something that's really significant about the murder of Fred Hampton was that the Chicago Police Department cooperated with the FBI in this while also targeting the Puerto Rican movement in Chicago as well. And then in 1955, which was one year before COINTELPRO began, the NYPD founded the Bureau of Special Services, or BOSS, to quote unquote drive the pinks out of the country. For those who may not know, pinks is like a derogatory term for communists, radicals, leftists, etc. And they were popularly, popularly known as the Red Squad and infiltrated the Communist Party and various municipal agencies. From 1957 to 1971, this um, boss, they collaborated with COINTELPRO to target the Communist Party as well as Puerto Rican nationalists. And from this, we can see that the NYPD has a history of repressing political activists and still has an interest in doing so through the Strategic Response Group, which I'll be addressing later. And these are now some more recent examples of political repression under the FBI. So the first one we're going to be talking about is the anti-war 23. In 2010, 23 anti-war and international solidarity activists across the Midwest were raided and subpoenaed by the FBI due to alleged material support for terrorism. All of those who were um, targeted refused to stand to the grand jury and they all continue to organize to this day. And then in 2011, um, Carlos Montes, who's a Chicano activist who led the East LA walkouts in 1968, uh, the LA sheriffs broke into his apartment, arresting him and ransacked his home for owning a legally permitted firearm. They took documents and questioned him about the anti-war 23, which had nothing to do with the supposed gun charges they were targeting him with. And then in 2013, the Department of Homeland Security arrested Rasmia Oda, who was charged with trumped up immigration violation charges. Her case was linked to the anti-war 23 through assistant U.S. Attorney Barry Jonas. And when the FBI couldn't find a connection to terrorism through the anti-war 23, they went after Rosmia, who she herself, um, for those who might not know, was a, is a prominent Palestinian activist who worked with Arab and Muslim women and children in Chicago through the Arab American Action Network. And this shows that the FBI will not stop targeting a movement or even if they cannot find any criminal mischief. And so ultimately, while she did end up getting deported to Jordan, her case had victories along the way as a result of people organizing for her. One um, such victory was one judge having to recuse himself after being exposed as having Zionist ties and also receiving lesser um, punishments along the way due to having mass support. And what these cases show is that through mass organizing and support, we can have victories against the FBI, and we must continue to call out and expose their tactics used against those who speak out against injustice. 
And so I know this is like a lot of information. It might seem kind of intimidating. It's like, why should we organize? Why should we fight back if there's this big enemy against us? Well, I have just the answer for you. So this is just some basic guidelines of what to do if the FBI does try to get in contact with you. One thing is, the most important thing is you have every right, you do not have to speak with them whatsoever. Tell them to speak with your attorney and then tell your attorney that you do not wish to speak with them. Um, and unless they have a warrant, you have the right to refuse them from entering your residence. And I actually had to learn this lesson the hard way because in 2016, while I was organizing with the Community to Stop FBI Repression in Tampa, I came home to see various business cards from an FBI agent on my family's front door and in my uh, mother's car window, as well as a voicemail that was left on my family's voicemail machine. And unsure of what to do, I got in contact with Tom Burke, who's a national organizer with the Committee to Stop FBI Oppression, who then got me in um, contact with Michael Deutsch, who was Rosmia's lawyer, um, actually. And so what I was able to do was talk to him and tell them that I told the attorney that I was not interested in speaking with the FBI. So he then called the FBI on my behalf, told them I was not interested in speaking with them, and then they never followed up, and they left me alone. But what we did do was Fight Back News, which is a um, leftist publication. They wrote an article about my experience, and then we spread this article around and told people about it in order to raise awareness and show, you know, in, in the face of political repression, we cannot be afraid. So I'm here with the Community to Stop FBI Repression, but who are we? So the Community to Stop FBI Repression started nationally as an organization in response to the 2010 raids of the anti-war 23. Locally, we started organizing around a year and a half ago more consistently, and the Community to Stop FBI Repression we organize to support communities and movements against political repression, both here and abroad. This includes organizing toward an end to state violence and harassment, as well as an end to all U.S. wars. This has included campaigning for justice for Rosmia Oda, standing in solidarity with countries such as the Philippines and Palestine against U.S. intervention, and our demands to disband the Strategic Response Group, a unit within the NYPD that is deployed to protest under the guise of disorderly conduct, but will target, harass, and arrest peaceful protesters, as well as utilize surveillance technology and possess military-grade weapons. And we're looking to continue to organize and expand our campaign um, against political harassment. So please, if you're interested in organizing with us, we meet every Tuesday at 7 p.m. And you could talk to myself, you could talk to Michaela, Pamela, Colin, anyone who's in CSFR, just raise your hand real quick. You could talk to one of us um, about continuing to organize with us and coming out to our meetings, which are every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jess, um, and thank you to Committee uh, to Stop FBI Repression for coming out and organizing this with us. Um, so my name is Rafa, uh, as was mentioned, this is Jorge, we're from New York Boricua Resistance, um, and we're going to tag team this next presentation around um, the FBI's intervention specifically in Puerto Rico um, and against the independence movement, um, not just in Puerto Rico, but also here, right, among the diaspora, because the FBI has not only targeted there, but has also targeted us here. Um, and so we need to be really clear about that, um, and we have to be clear about the understanding that the FBI is very scared, the nation of the U.S. is very scared of Puerto Rican independence. Um, and that is because they have been doing nothing else but stealing from our people for many years, right? Um, and they are scared for us to break free because they want to continue to steal. Um, but we're not going to let that happen, right? So, um, a lot of people don't know sometimes the history of how the FBI in itself um, has also continued to support the Commonwealth very directly, right? And the blackmail that um, is the history of that. So this is Pedro Abisu Campos, who here has heard that name before. I hope a lot of hands go up, right? 
Um, if you haven't heard the name, uh, he was one of, one of the founders of the Nationalist Party. Um, and in 1930s, he led sugar strikes on the island um, because the sugar workers were making less than a dollar a day. And so he was fighting to get the sugar workers to make more money, right? Um, and so in the, 1930s, in the 1930s, he leads these sugar strikes. The sugarcane workers win, and they get like a dollar increase, okay, um, to their wages. So of course, that doesn't sit well with the US, right? Because they're like, we don't want to pay these sugarcane workers more money. Um, who's this guy who's leading these resistance efforts? You know, who's this guy who's talking about independence for Puerto Rico? This is not OK. So the first uh, FBI agent arrives in 1936. The US Attorney General at the time is A. Cecil Snyder. And he writes to the president, he writes to the US, and he says, basically, these Puerto Ricans are out of control. They're talking about uh, independence. They're talking about how the US is, is terrible. Um, we need to stop them. You need to send people to stop them, right? So the first agent arrives. Um, Let's also be very clear that these agents were not working by themselves, but they were working with the insular police departments in Puerto Rico that were the colonial police departments, right? Because we have to understand that the police departments exist to uphold colonial and capitalist regimes, right? They also do not want to see us free. And that is not just in Puerto Rico, but that's here as well, right? Um, that's why they're in our communities here too. So at this time, they're working with the insular police department, and months later, after this FBI agent arrives, Albizu Campos and others are arrested and convicted for sedition, and they're imprisoned for 11 years. Um, he's first brought to Atlanta, and then he becomes sick, so he's brought to then New York to finish the rest of his, imprison his imprisonment due to illness. So J. Edgar Hoover issues a memo to the FBI to look into every part of the lives of all the nationalists, right? He wants to know everything. He wants to know when they wake up. He wants to know who their family members are. Where do they go? Where do they hang out? Um, it's not just about their political activities. It's about any aspect of their life he wants to know. And the other person that he wants to know a great deal about is Luis Munoz Marin, okay? And Jorge is going to talk more about that. <clears throat> So when we talk about oh, oh sorry, so when we talk about the FBI and its influence in Puerto Rico, that's literally what it is. FBI has constructed the political stance that we see Puerto Rico in today, and the material and the conditions there have not changed since. So when we talk about owning the governorship, uh, that's literally what the FBI did. They stole the governorship from the people of Puerto Rico, and I'll explain this in more detail. So Luis Munoz Marin was the first. Puerto Rican free, quote unquote freely elected governor of Puerto Rico. But in reality, he was uh, really blackmailed an agent of the FBI. Now, going on for his life a little bit, he was born in Puerto Rico. Um, he lived his life like any other person. And he was, at one point in his college life, uh, independentista. He was pro independence. What happened along the line was his addiction. He fell addicted to opioids and went on to spend all his money and traveled um, in and out of the mainland from New York to Puerto Rico. It wasn't until he finally got himself as president of the Senate where he was forced to make a decision. The FBI threatened him and said, we will expose your addiction or you work for us. So he ended up taking the stance of essentially betraying his people. And once he was elected to the governorship, he reversed all his independence policies and pushed really forth this commonwealth status we're in today. And this will actually later affect as when there was the uprising back in the 50s with uh, the Nationalist Party, he was literally one of the targets they were aiming for. Um, Essentially, right now, he's still recognized as the father of the current Puerto Rican culture and people. And that's one thing that we should all just remember, like, no, we, <laughs> he's not. We have to realize that he was one working with the oppressors and decided to take the shortcut to make sure his addiction and his status as you know, governor or whoever wasn't affected. I'm just going to touch one more thing on that. The other thing about him is he passed something called the gag law. Does anybody know what the gag law is here? 
Okay, so it was illegal to fly a Puerto Rican flag. It was illegal to sing the national, the true national anthem of Puerto Rico. Um, and you had thousands of people who were imprisoned uh, during this time, some for up to 20 years, for flying the flag, for um, singing the national anthem, for speaking about Puerto Rico uh, independence in any kind of way. Okay, and he was the person who made that happen, right? Um, in working with the FBI and these groups. So now we're going to FBI repression actually on the island. So the FBI conducted themselves for a 40 year long campaign on illegal surveillance and tapping of all Puerto Rican individuals who were involved in any type of activism, whether it be pro independence, labor, or even environmental. They were considered an, a threat just for the fact that any type of a action on the island would inspire uprisings as they would, one, look at the history of the, how the Spanish dealt with Puerto Rico, being that the Spanish, the Puerto Rican people have always risen up during their colonial status, and they will continue to do so. Um, a lot of the times when we talk about Puerto Rico, we kind of leave out the people here in the continental United States. And I just want to bring light that due to economic policies in Puerto Rico, there was a forced migration into New York and as well as Chicago, uh, West Coast, and even Florida. So when we talk about the Puerto Rican people, we also have to include all these communities that are at times not considered true Puerto Rican or separated into their own little diaspora, which we're not a diaspora, we're one people because that's how they try to separate us. So, even though there's individuals here in the mainland, in the United States, the independent struggle never failed. People were always were advocating here on the ground. Now, when we talk about repression, we also have to talk about the fact that during the uprising with Pedro Bisco Campos with the Nationalist Party, uh, the several individuals from the Nationalist Party here in uh, now New York went down to Washington, D.C. and attempted to assassinate the president as a means to free the island. It was during this time that the FBI already knew that they already knew that this was going to happen again. This was going to reoccur. So every time they would have new Puerto Ricans come to the island, there was always a checklist. And also, um, during the uprising time, there was actually the f arrest of 2,000 activists in Puerto Rico, many of them sent to La Princesa, which was a insular, um, correct me if I'm wrong, insular prison meant for political, meant for just anyone trying to fight for independence. That's where you would get Pedro Albizu Campos, where he was tortured and radiated. But we'll talk about that more f uh, furtherly. Um, so going to the repression of the 80s and 90s, you see uh, groups form up like the Macheteros, as well as other smaller independent groups, as well as the, uh, the popular Boricua Army. And they would actually commit some of the best uh, liberation fronts, one being the Wells Fargo, uh, Wells Fargo, Fargo, sorry, yes, banks, they don't sit well with me. <laughs> <laughs> they, would, they would rob $7 million in Connecticut. And they always want to paint them as terrorists. But I want everyone to know where that money actually went to. A lot of that money didn't go to killing people. All that money went to communities back in Puerto Rico to uh, fund community community programs, essentially. And you know they they, they, don't, they don't want to tell you that. Also, a lot of the crimes, quote unquote, crimes committed here, um, most of them were nonviolent. Yes, there was uh, several hundred bombings, but. They only destroyed corporate, military, and police property. They never killed an individual. So they always want to paint, you know, any type of act of rebellion as the worst of the worst. We have to remember when you're fighting for your land, for your people, you know, all all games are everything's off the table. And even when you don't kill anyone, like and you know, you want to keep speaking and speaking, it's just so far you could go with it. Uh, so going to Colonel Pro a little bit. So during this time, as we said, there was surveillance of the Puerto Rican population and of all uh, activists. Colonel Pro was an essential tool as they would use it both here and in Puerto Rico. 
and at times uh, Puerto Rico as a status would sometimes have um, agents of the CIA also operating there um, because as you know Puerto, the reason people want to keep Puerto Rico was because it's the open door to the rest of Latin America so, and they're still currently using today for Venezuela and Cuba surveillance. So when you talk about COINTELPRO, um, so the FBI, um, they tap Pedro Campos' phone, and this was during the time when he was actually already dying, because he was uh, radiated, as I said before, he was radiated to the point of no turning back. Uh, and just to talk more on that about fair oppression, I wanna talk about New York and Chicago. So the form formation of the Young Lords Party would see the Puerto Rican people here, born and raised here, fighting for independence and better community services for their people. Uh, Operation Cointel Pro would want to dismantle those type of organizations as it wouldn't fit the status quo. You would see FBI infiltration in all these organizations in New York as well as Chicago, um, mainly leading to Jose Chacha Jimenez's self-exile back in Chicago for two years as he was wanted for a possession of a firearm. And he would later, he would go to his uh, underground ranch out in Wisconsin and would later, later form the Puerto Rican Revolutionary Workers Organization that would later have ties to the Macheteros in the 80s back in Puerto Rico. But just to talk off um, a little bit about New York as well, there was a split between both organizations, mainly due to uh, one infiltration and internal struggles that uh, they couldn't be rectified. So going off um, more deeply into the COINTEL <laughs> Pro, I want to just paint the picture of one, their surveillance on a particular group, and that would be the um, Independence Party of Puerto Rico, which itself is not a revolutionary party, but they're still being uh, surveillance by the FBI, even though they're, uh, a, they are actual third party on the island of Puerto Rico. They are part of all elections, and they resemble a lot of similar third parties here in the United States, so Democrat, Republican, with the, I think it's called Libertarian Party, so they would sim um, symbolize those type of um, elections. Now, just to add on to that, uh, when we were doing this, uh, I, I sent to Rafa the FBI vault, which actually contains all the information on the FBI website of documents they collected on surveillance. Now, uh, Hunter College took it a step further, and they've, they ordered all their paperwork to come, and it's, correct me if I'm wrong, 1 point something million? 1.8 million. 1.8 million pages that have been delivered to Hunter <laughs> College. Uh, yeah. I would hate to be that person to look, go through it. So if you actually look on the file, it's like really mundane things. Like this person walked over here, they had a phone call with this person. This is how minute the details were that they were collecting on the independence liberation fighters, okay? That they're still collecting, I mean, and Jorge will go into that in a second. But, um, I think you know why we call this event Las Carpetas, right? Is to is to talk about the documents, the folders that are on each fighter, right? You're talking about thick folders that have details that you know, like this. They, there was one that was like, this man is extracting teeth in his house, like weird details like that, right? That oh, that that you're like, what are you talking about? Um, but when you come through these files, you realize that they were really watching every single minute of people's lives. Um, yeah. yeah, and just to go off um, that point, there was um, several parts that were like, at one point I was going through the PDF, and it was a thousand page PDF, and there was about 10 pages just all blacked out. Yes. And I'm like, why would they include it in the first place? There's nothing on it, it's just a blank page. Anyway, long thoughts. Yeah, large portions are blacked out because they don't actually want you, they'll release it, right? But they don't actually want, want you to know it. what yeah. was in it. I, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just to go off a personal uh, story, uh, my mom, she's born and raised in Puerto Rico. She was a student activist back in her day. And uh, a lot of her friends were part of the uh, teacher and labor struggle over there, fighting for union rights. And uh, her, her friends, because they all live in the same town, they, they recently ordered their uh, Las Tercapetas. 
And so, so one person who was never, he, he went to one meeting I heard to the student organizing meeting, and he had 300 pages on him. And he never did it, he, he never voted, never did any political, he never showed up for a rally. And it goes into detail, like, he went to the bathroom, mm -hmm. he bought a sandwich, he went to class, he failed. <laughs> So I'm just I'm just really trying to detail like they really are surveilling us heavily because <clears throat> they think anything we do could be a threat to quote unquote their security. So um, that leads us into we just want to talk a little bit about Filiberto. Um, who here has ever heard that name before? Okay. Um, so you know he was the commander of um, the Machateros, right? And um, one fun, or I think a good story about the Wells Fargo um, robbery that took place, or, or reclaiming of funds, I guess we'll call it, that took place, um, is that for Three Kings Day, um, some of the macheteros dressed up as the Three Kings and showed up in neighborhoods with toys that they had bought for the kids with some of the money that they had taken. Um, and you know, that, that's just to show that, that when you talk about revolutionary armies, you're not talking about um, violent criminals. You're talking about revolutionaries who are willing to do anything to liberate their people. And um, there's a big difference between that and the criminals that they make them out to be, okay? Um, so just keep that in mind. So on September 23rd, anybody recognize that date? It's a very important date to Puerto Ricans. What is it? Just shout it out if you know. Rito de Lares. Rito de Lares, okay? Um, so on September 23rd, um, Filiberto was in his 70s, he was recovering from open heart surgery, okay, and he was in his home in Hormigueros with his wife, um, and 200 FBI agents went in, declared martial law in the neighborhood so nobody could get in and nobody could get out, okay, you're talking about elderly people who are living there who needed access to medications, who were denied um, any kind of, you know, help. Um, they raided his home and they entered in, and these are FBI agents that had received training in Iraq, okay? And they went in with high-powered rifles. You're talking about Iraq, you know, military-grade weaponry, okay? To raid the home of a 70-something-year-old man who's recovering from open-heart surgery, okay? This is the kind of FBI we're talking about. This is the kind of repression we're talking about. This is his home, okay? This is the home that they raided. We had the opportunity, um, I had the opportunity to go with a queer and trans brigade to Puerto Rico in January, and we were able to visit his home where they're taking care of it. Um, and so if you look at the home, these are the bullet, the bullet holes that you see, okay? You're talking again, 70-year-old man recovering from surgery, and they went in, and they went in guns blazing, right? Ready to kill. Though they say they need to arrest him, okay? I, I can't even count how many, but, but we asked them, I think they said it was like in the hundreds, but I don't remember the exact amount. He was shot near this refrigerator, um, and he began to bleed, and he had even offered to surrender, and he offered to surrender, and he offered to um, surrender to a specific person, and they denied him that. And instead, they brought him to the window so that people could see, and then he bled out on the carpet right in front of his, of his door, okay? And he died. And they, they airlifted him, but he still died. Um, why do we talk about Filiberto? Well, one, he's a freedom fighter, okay? And we want to honor him because he did a lot for our people. Um, but two, we want to talk about how ruthless the FBI is and how scared they are of Puerto Rican independence that they send 200 agents, how cowardly they are to send 200 agents to arrest and to assassinate an elderly man in his home. This is the level that we're talking about, okay? When people talk about FBI repression, we're not talking about, you know, oh, they came and they, you know, one agent came and was watching. No, we're talking about assassinations. We're talking about killings. And this wasn't even in the 90s. This wasn't even in the 80s. This was in the 2000s that this occurred, okay? This is modern times that this occurred. So, a little while after, right, they requested that there be an investigation into his death because they said this wasn't right, this was a violation of human rights. And the other thing I want to highlight is that when he was killed, the streets, the people in Puerto Rico flooded the streets for him to mourn him. Whether they agreed with independence or not, Filiberto had the hearts of the people and they still flooded the, the streets to mourn him and to talk about what he had done for the people. 
So the FBI issued a report uh, which concluded that the FBI used excessive force, um, that they used military-grade weapons in the arrest of a civilian, um, that even though the FBI claimed that Ojeda Rios was the first shooter, the first shooter was the FBI, um, and that they blocked available medical personnel on the premises from assisting uh, Filiberto, um, and that this was the illegal killing of him. Now, yes, they found all this out, but ask me how many people have been held accountable for the crime? None. None. To this day. They, they can issue this as much as they want, but nobody's been held accountable for the death of Filiberto. Okay, and so that's why we continue to cry out for justice, because it's not over yet. So I want to end this, this portion in talking about the fact that this happened in 2005, right, which is modern days. It's still happening, okay? Our people are still being surveyed. And so we have the honor of having Jocelyn here from Sacabano La Promesas, who is fighting on the front lines right now in Puerto Rico for independence, for the, for the rights of our people, um, and who's going to talk a little bit about the repression that is currently happening there, um, because it's not over yet. And so give it up for Jocelyn, please. We're really happy to have her here, and Rogelio, and the kids. Um, she's going to speak in Spanish. And Tiffany here from New York Boricua Resistance is going to translate um, for those of us who don't speak Spanish, okay? So just give us a second. Okay, we're going to start with the video. Buenas tardes a todas y a todos. Perdón. Eh, 
le quiero dar las gracias a los compañeros de New York eh, Boricua Resistant por habernos invitado, gracias a los compañeros de Call to Action y gracias a la gente de People Forum que nos ha permitido estar aquí. Eh, muchas gracias a todos, ¿verdad? Por, han sido súper amables y nos han tratado muy bien desde que llegamos. Bien, para hablar del tema de la represión, me dicen si voy muy rápido. Uh -huh. Uh, well, first, I'd like to give thanks to NYBR, Call to Action, and for the People's Forum for letting me speak here today. Um, everyone has been very great, and I'm happy to be here and now to start talking about repression. Para hablar del tema de la represión, primero tenemos que entender que a diferencia de los estados, en Puerto Rico, el gobierno eh, ha cedido sus poderes al gobierno federal. Uh, first, when it comes to repression, first we need to understand that uh, different from the U.S., the Puerto Rico has given up uh, its power to the U.S. Así que la poca autonomía o poder que pudiera tener eh, los gobiernos puertorriqueños se la han cedido al federal. That means that the little autonomy that Puerto Rico did have has been succeeded on to the federal government con la esperanza de que eso facilite que seamos un estado. Um, with the hope that it will make it easier for us to become a state. Así que cuando los activistas en Puerto Rico tomamos la calle de la manera que sea, uh, so whenever we take the streets as activists, however we can, eh, siempre hay alguna posibilidad de que se nos radique en cargos federales. It's always still possible that we'll lose at the federal level. Así que, este, para entrar ya de lleno del tema de la represión, pero quería que tuvieran eso, pudieran comprender entonces la complejidad del asunto. So before I started talking about repression, I just wanted to make sure that everyone at least understood that part. En Puerto Rico la represión tiene diferentes formas de ejecutarse. There's different ways that repression is represented in Puerto Rico. Está lo que es la fuerza represiva del Estado. There's the uh, repressive force by the state. Eh, cuando hay manifestaciones, pues se movilizan, como vieron en el video, eh, fuerza de choque, la unidad montada, fura, etc. Uh, one of the ways is um, when they use force against our movements, uh, like they did in the streets in the video. Pero no se limitan a eso. Pero es not limited to that. Cuando radican cargos contra compañeras o compañeros por eh, acciones de militancia en la calle, when they drop charges against us for um, uh, militant movements in the streets, suelen ser por casos frívolos. Uh, the, they basically are putting trumped up charges. Eh, por ejemplo, eh, policías que alegan que un compañero les tiró ácido a su uniforme. For example, the police will claim that um, one of uh, our comrades would have thrown acid at their uniforms. Y cuando ves el video, es un vaso de agua que se le cayó a alguien encima un policía. But when they actually see the video, they'll see that it was just a bottle of water. A glass of water, sorry. El problema es que ese tipo de casos a veces están dos y tres años en los tribunales. And that case will um, be in the courts for about two to three years. Actualmente, Posterior a los eventos del primero de mayo del 2017, todavía hay casos en las cortes por casos, como dije antes, que no tienen ningún sentido. Uh, there's cases that are still around for situations that don't make any sense that all started back in May 2017. Probablemente el caso más emblemático es el de la compañera Nina Gross. Uh, the most prominent case is the case of uh, Milagros. Nina Dross. Nina, Nina, Nina Dross. Dross, sorry. <laughs> Nina Dross. Eh, Nina fue acusada en el 2017 por intentar quemar un edificio de cinco pisos. Uh, she was accused uh, for attempting to burn down a five-story building in 2017. Con un encendedor en una acera. With a cigarette lighter in the street. With a cigarette lighter in the street. <laughs> Y por, ese, por esa acusación ella está cumpliendo cinco años en la cárcel federal. For that, she's spending five years in federal prison. Mientras que políticos y policías que han incurrido en serios casos de violencia o de corrupción, muchos no han cumplido ni un solo año de cárcel. 
whereas there's a lot of police and politicians that uh, have have done a lot of violence and corruption and they're not serving any time. Así que la Corte Federal es en Puerto Rico y el FBI y se constituyen en un mecanismo de intimidación a la protesta y a la lucha por la independencia. So basically the federal courts are basically functioning as a way of intimidating the uh, movements in Puerto Rico. En el caso específico de nosotros se acabaron las promesas, pues muchos de, los compañeros, de nuestros compañeros han sido arrestados y se les han fabricado casos. Um, in, in our case, in, se acabaron las promesas group, a lot of our comrades have already been arrested. El pasado año, uno de nuestros portados, el compañero Scott Valdez, fue intervenido por la policía, por los federales y por el FBI y se le quitó su, su celular. Eh, aún no tenemos ninguna información de por qué hicieron eso. Uh, and last year, uh, one of our comrades were uh, arrested by the FBI and they took their cell phone away and we still don't know why they did it or what's going on. Parte de las estrategias que ellos han utilizado es que ellos no se identifican. Uh, one of their strategies is that they don't identify themselves. Ellos entran a los negocios donde hay manifestantes comiendo, bebiendo. They enter different businesses where people are just, you know, drinking, eating, things like that. Eh, secuestran a los manifestantes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so while people are, are eating and just using these businesses, they're uh, arrested right away. Eh, yo, yo lo llamo un secuestro porque no se identifican como policías, sus vehículos no están rotulados y muchas veces pasan muchas horas paseándolos en vehículos antes de llevarlos a un cuartel. So I call it a kidnapping because they don't identify themselves, they uh, just come in and there's no way of knowing why they're there and they just uh, ride the, the cars around the town without, uh, in a way so that they won't know where they're going. Una vez llegan a los cuarteles, una vez... Sorry, it's unregistered police cars, the police car doesn't like, you don't see them with lights or anything. Una vez llegan a los cuarteles, ¿verdad? se movilizan y hacen el trabajo eh, no les permiten hablar con los abogados no les dicen por qué los arrestaron no les permiten hablar con su familia y muchas veces hay que recurrir a movilizaciones y presión en los cuarteles para que entonces por fin radiquen lo que sea que ellos se vayan a inventar Uh, they refuse to talk with the lawyers and they refuse to let the families know what's going on, so we have to work to pressure them into revealing this information. Okay. Así que they, don't let the, they don't let the person who's been uh, arrested talk to the lawyers. Okay. Así que eh, se crea un clima en el que ¿verdad? la gente que se tira a la calle a manifestar se está consciente que pueden ser arrestados sin sin ningún motivo y que esas, eh, esos casos se pueden extender por muchos años eh, coactando su capacidad de movilización y su capacidad ¿verdad? De, de, de ser efectivos en su activismo. So when these people take the streets to protest, they do, they do so knowing that there's the possibility of them being arrested for absolutely no reason and that their ability to protest will be put on pause for quite a long time. Pero eso no se limita a nosotros. Eh, el FBI en Puerto Rico trabaja con absoluta impunidad. Uh, that doesn't, that doesn't or stop us. We know that the FBI is going to be working with complete impunity. Eh, por ejemplo, hace alrededor de dos años, tal vez más, eh, dos ex eh, compañeros vinculados a los macheteros, el Norberto Sintron Fiallo y Orlando González Claudio, fueron detenidos de sus carros en la carretera y se les obligó a entregar muestra de su ADN y aún no se sabe por qué hicieron eso. Uh, for example, about two years ago, two of our comrades were detained in the, uh, from their cars in the middle of the street and they even collected DNA samples from them and they didn't explain why. Two of those comrades were members of the Macheteros. That's a very important uh, Two of those members were members of the Macheteros. Así que, eh, el clima de represión se da a diferentes escalas, ¿verdad? En, este, desde la manifestación en la calle, los tribunales, las intervenciones en tu casa, etcétera. 
Eh, por ejemplo, hace poco escuchaba el tema de las carpetas. El, el asunto de las carpetas es mucho más profundo incluso. Eh, aquí hay carpetas de los hijos de los activistas. Uh, <risa> Por, por tu llevar a tu hijo a una manifestación, ya eso era, le, le, le brinda a ellos licencia, ¿verdad?, para mantener un registro, incluso de, de menores de edad, eh, eso implica cómo van a ser tus relaciones laborales, cómo van a ser tus relaciones familiares, y aunque ellos alegan que ya las carpetas no existen, nosotros sabemos que es falso. Los que somos activistas sabemos que nuestras casas son constantemente asediadas. So when it comes to this environment of repression, it, it reaches all the way out into the streets, into the courts, into our homes. There's even uh, FBI documents, not only for the activists, but also their kids and grandkids. These are minors that they're collecting information on. Pero lo importante aquí, y voy a el mensaje que queremos dejarle, es que indistintamente de esa represión, eso nunca ha intimidado al pueblo puertorriqueño en luchar por su independencia. Uh, despite all of this repression, this has not been able to stop the Puerto Rican people for, from fighting for their independence. Y aunque la diáspora puertorriqueña eh, también tiene una larga historia de represión que narrar, el vínculo de la diáspora y los puertorriqueños en la isla ha sido constante y la lucha por la independencia de Puerto Rico ha sido una que se ha dado en ambos frentes y se seguirá dando no importa lo que hagan los federales. Así que pues, muchas gracias por, por la atención, por el espacio y como les dije antes, la lucha sigue y todas y todos somos necesarios, Puerto Rico va a ser libre. No porque los yanquis nos den la, la, la independencia, la independencia se la va a dar el pueblo puertorriqueño a nosotras y a nosotros los puertorriqueños. Uh, we've been trying to best to fight from different fronts, and Puerto Rico will definitely be free, and it will be at their own hands that they will get that freedom. We're going to have a performance right now. Uh, coming up from uh, Harlem Solidarity Defense and Gabriela New York, we have Zila Renfro. Zila. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really honored to be here today. Yes, as um, in, I was introduced, I'm Zyla. I'm from Harlem Solidarity and Defense. Um, we do anti-displacement work in Harlem, um, and you know, studying and learning about Black liberation struggle. Um, it's so connected to the issue of FBI repression, as was mentioned in the, the history that we learned today. Um, so I'm very, very happy to be here and to support and to learn and connect um, with the Puerto Rican independence movement. But there's a song I wrote called Avenge, and I was thinking about all the people that have died for um, our freedom and who will continue to die for our freedom. Um, So yeah, if you guys want to snap along with me, feel, if you know the words I've sang before, feel free to sing along too. So. Only we can feel it, how the earth teared again. They stirred up demons in the bullet dust, ghosts in the wind. A little earthquake rumbles angry under our feet. We try to grasp at the grass, but we bloody our knees. Maybe it was better down here in the dirt, cause they don't know that the spirits live just below earth. So we bow ourselves and listen to the ancestors cool. Softly, they tell me, baby, here's what you do. Take your time, cause whenever you stand up again, brush the dirt off, hold your head up, ground your feet in avenge. Avenge, avenge, avenge me. I said, baby, avenge. Avenge, avenge, avenge me. You see, you now I may have tired, but baby, you are alive. And the best revenge is that our children gonna thrive. And so we gotta fight, and we're gonna get tired, and we'll probably fall, and we'll probably cry. But while you're alive, avenge, avenge, avenge me. 
Organize the people, they're the only hope that we have. Build on our movement by correcting the mistakes of the past. Feel the power, collective love is yours to attain. It's a science, honey, study you and leave me in vain. We're tired, and every battle feels so uphill. But just because you're down today, don't mean you won't find the will. Take your time, cause whenever you stand up again, brush the dirt off, hold your head up, ground your feet in revenge. Avenge, avenge, avenge me. I said, baby, avenge. Avenge, avenge, avenge me. I may have died, but baby, you are alive. And the best revenge is that our children gonna thrive. And so we gotta fight, and we're gonna get tired, and we'll probably fall, we'll probably cry. But while we're alive, avenge, avenge, avenge me. Revenge isn't bad anger, but keep your rage, cause it makes you strong. Revenge is bad love, it's only about righting the wrongs. So while you're alive, baby, just keep me in mind. Cause the best revenge is we're all gonna be fine. And so we gotta fight, and we're gonna get tired, and we'll probably fall, we'll probably cry. But while we're alive, avenge, avenge, avenge me. We got it? Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks. I am not suicidal. I just think about dying. And if I told you I was fine, I was definitely lying. But we say that shit because there's no use in crying. And on the inside, I'm steady breaking down. But it would probably be fine if I didn't have to pretend. But to get through the day, I truly have to pretend. So I sit rigid and smile like there's a gun to my head while I dream of when they'll put me in the ground. Capitalism, a sickening rhythm of hating, of waiting, and navigating the system. All we have is our people and the songs that they leave us. I press play and I thank God for the sound. It's hard not to be bitter, cause I only want better. When I'm alone, I can't help thinking I will be here forever. But comrade reminds me that we're gonna get free, so I say fuck it and decide to stick around. So much death. Has there always been this much death? Gonna be retired from the bodies that he's had to collect. The girl's trans sister's dying, he picked up from the tree. We both don't even got a soul, and he saw that and weeped. Do you think his feet are tired? Is he running out of bags for loved ones' bodies? Does he sleep well? Has anyone asked? Cause I know the poor reaper sees the things that I see. I'll be checking on the reaper, think his heart is heavy. My heart is heavy, my family's heart is heavy. Fucked up and all of us need therapy. But organizing is my religion. And though I catch myself sinning, all my priests are old black whip. They know the deal, even though they can't deal. Then they always keep it moving, like just keep swimming, getting whipped and barely blink. I watch my heart sinks the way we praise resilience while we're pushing the bank. Why can't we praise the days that I can't leave bed And I'm crying and I can't get out my own head But then I buckle down, brush my face on my sleeve And I shower, brush my teeth, and I manage to leave Those are the victories that I win every day And slowly building freedom is the way that I pray, so I pray Thank you, Zyla